Welcome, everyone. We are so excited today to have our uh, special guest for the Cloud Salon, James Paris. <laughs> and he is a multilingual visionary whose work on the page and screen spans many fields, animation, live action, both feature and series, kids and adult entertainment. His credits range from the Disney animation renaissance of the 90s through the millennial rise of superhero blockbuster features to a recent animated series on Netflix and Apple TV. Uh, he has an incredible experience both in industry, but for today, he will be sharing his most recent independent short, which he was the writer and director of, uh, Snooky. And then we will talk about his practice, his inspirations, his sort of advice in terms of, in particular, people going through um, working both in industry and then cultivating your own artistic practice. So welcome, James. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Um, would you like to say anything before we screen Snooky? Um, let's see. Uh, I, that's a good question. Do you want to, cause maybe we just go, let's just dive in. And then I guess if you want to just, cause we'll probably just stream of consciousness Q and a probably after we look at it. Correct. Oh, of course. And we can do this any way you want. So oh, and okay. I should say you are joining us from the city of angels from Los Angeles. <laughs> uh, you did study here in New York city and yes you know, made your way westward through uh, <laughs> yes. Florida and Disney and all those places. Once a New Yorker, um, always a New Yorker. Yes. <laughs> exactly. So <laughs> we got a good New York spirit here. Um, but yeah, I just thought it would be fun to start with that piece. And then we can sort of unpack some of the themes in the piece, what brought you to making it. And, sure. and But did you want to, to set it up? In any oh, you way? want me to tee it up? Um, basically, uh, it's... Uh, uh, you know, if there are about like maybe three different major hats that I'm known for wearing, um, obviously animation is a giant hat that most of the industry knows me for. Visual effects for live action films, that's another. Um, but the writer director hat, you know, you could argue that's the one that's closest to who I really am because, you know, we all have ideas that are inside of us trying to be born. Um, and I think the muscle that has to be exercised the most is telling your own stories. Um, obviously, you don't normally do that with feature films or entire series, but shorts are a way to work those muscles out. So I always say as storytellers, we have to hit the gym regularly and making shorts is how I hit the gym. <laughs> That's so good. That's so good. Yeah. All right. Let's, let's get our, our muscles ready. <laughs> <laughs> So for this, I think we're, it's going to work best if everybody turns off their camera um, and also mute your mic. And then afterward, we can come back on if we want and ask questions. So John, as you are ready, let's watch Snooky. Bullshit! No, 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 no more conversation. It's all bullshit. Everything is bullshit. Whatever this is, you need to get it together and listen because you're starting to spin out. Bullshit! bullshit. I can't do this anymore. I... What? what the hell is going on with you today? You say you love me, but you. you. I... Please stop. Stop. Okay? Just need to call. I hate it. You, this place, my life. I hate it. It's bullshit. <laughs> you know what's bullshit? Is you throwing a tantrum every time you don't get your way. Could it be that maybe I'm just sick of all this? Fine, fine. You broke your grand midlife crisis performance. I will call the Oscar committee and an ambulance. Or you can come back downstairs and we 
can talk about finding you a job. You really can't help yourself, can you? It's like condescension no, is your no, superpower. No, 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 no. You know nothing. Not once have I held that over you. But I keep this roof over our heads and you know it. Right. Shit. I'm done, Eve. I'm just done. Three years. I just feel like I can't remember a life before this. Like, I, uh, I can't remember a life before you. I can't. I... Adam, Adam, baby! Snooky! <laughs> It's not working. Is your companion malfunctioning? Oh, can I get a full factory reset, please? Okay. I, I need a, I need a full factory uh, reset. It's okay. an emergency. Okay. Full factory reset. Don't worry, Miss Gardner. We have it all under control. Okay, Miss Gardner. We've gone ahead and temporarily disabled your companion. You've requested a full factory reset. But I'd also like to make you aware of another feature we offer called Partial Timeline Adjustment. With this new feature, you can retain the bulk of your companion's memories. We can roll back to any point in the timeline. Yes, yes, yes. Does that sound like something that works for you? A timeline adjustment. Um, roll back, um, uh, one year? Just, just one. Okay. You've selected partial timeline adjustment. If you could go ahead and gently press the button behind your companion's left ear, this will signify that you accept all terms and conditions. Thank you, Ms. Gardner. I see your companion is now in safe mode, and I just need to walk you through a few more steps. Also, after we're done, if you're satisfied with your service today, please feel free to leave us a five-star review. Uh, Miss Gardner. <laughs> Miss Gardner, are you there? Hello? Miss Gardner? Hello? Did I fall asleep? Shit. <laughs> Why do I always do that? It's because you work so hard. That's what I love about you. You're my hard work and snooky. I am. I am. I am a hard working snooky. Happy anniversary, Snooky. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> so fun, so fun, so fun. Oh my Thank gosh, you. great. 
I haven't, yeah, had, so, I haven't looked at that in a while. I'm like, oh, yeah, that's right. I forgot that happened. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and I have seen this once before, but for most people, um, yeah, your first time. So uh, any reactions, questions, feel free to have those roll in the chat. And I think, you know, right now in April, this idea of a partial timeline adjustment just might be <laughs> really, really exciting to a lot of people. Am I right? Uh, could we just go back one month? You know? <laughs> well, who doesn't love the idea of being able to, you know, change anything retroactively, right? Right. Yeah. Have who hasn't that. fantasized about going back in time and doing something differently, right? <laughs> yes. At the touch of a button, something really magical. So it was so fun. I do it um, so all the time. About, yeah. <laughs> yeah, in our dreams. Mm -hmm. so tell us um, a little bit about how the idea for this came to you and then how you sort of built that out. Sure. Um, well, you know, I, I'm sure this is not news to anyone that among all the art forms known to mankind, film is like the most expensive. <laughs> you know, I started actually, I was an illustration major back when I was in college, well, high school and college, you know, I went to Pratt Institute in Brooklyn. And um, that was pencil and paintbrush. That was my life. And it was just about still images. But when I sort of got smitten by the idea of moving pictures, you know, animation was my gateway drug into the wonder of pictures that move and can react in real time and give emotions in real time. Um, and then that bled into, oh, I can get actors in front of a camera and do that too, you know. So, um, but one of the things I learned really quickly is if you're writing an idea that is just a, a world that you made inside your head without any respect paid to how are you going to achieve that in front of a camera, sometimes you can write locations that you just can't get. You know, I'm going to have this take place underwater with mermaids fighting, you know, whatever. <laughs> Great ideas, but if unless you're animating it, it, you're going to have to find a location that looks like the place you're writing. And one of the things I realized is that if I reverse that process, instead of coming up with a cool idea and hoping I can find a place that matches, can I come up with a place and find a place that I know I can have access to uh, that has great production value? Um, that's not my rink and ink apartment, you know what I mean? Uh, and write a story that matches the place that's still a story that I believe in, but that already matches the place I know I can get, well, then I have the built-in production value. And now I haven't shot myself in the foot. So that's what I did, actually, in this case. Um, it's a friend of a friend uh, owns this house. And my intermediary friend uh, lobbied on my behalf. And then I went to the owners and I told them what I wanted to do. And I assured them I would not break their house, you know, like, oh, well, are you going to have a big crew coming in? And of course, the first thing I told them was like, no, I'm a one man crew. And shorts like this, I am like, basically, I, I do everything. I have about four friends that help me out on the day. But I'm the writer, I'm the director, I'm the camera operator, I'm the editor, I'm the composer, I do the motion graphics <laughs> you know so that way it's, it's a very small footprint is in terms of people in their house and they are more inclined to say okay you're not going to break my house you can come on in and then i ask for two days access i ask for a day to shoot and then i ask for the day before that and this is when you when you're a one-man band one person band uh you need that extra day to practice and figure out your lighting setups so that on the day you're not wasting all this time trying to figure out a new lighting scenario. I spend the whole first day uh, with my friends set dressing, anything we have to change the curtains, put on the shears, um, anything that's prop, get that in there. We bring in lamps, there's always lamps. You know, one of the tricks is like fill rooms with lamps and then you can shoot in any, any direction. Um, but then let's figure out some lighting and do some stand-ins let me set up my camera let me figure out how that looks tweak it because lighting involves experimentation so if you give yourself that first day to just problem solve and then when your actors come in on the second day you don't have to waste their time with your indecisive lighting choices you know and then the second day is all let's get in, let's shoot let's shoot let's shoot let's shoot because we have to be out of this house at 7 p.m <laughs> and we really did i mean i was shooting that last dinner table 
while my friends were packing up all the stuff in the next room and um it was like we were racing like it's 6 30 okay all right hurry up hold his hand okay okay let's get that thing one more line and then we got to switch and get his coverage and you know and we those last that whole dinner table thing was like 40 minutes of just let's just get it as quickly as we can anyway i probably answered way more than your question <laughs> No, it's so fascinating and it's so smart. It's such an interesting approach to, in a way, set yourself up for success. You have this incredible space that does communicate so much for your story, for these characters, right? And then they're dressed like all the other parts of like how they're dressed and how they move mm. and where they're you know, going, all the props. That's much easier to sort of sort out but in a way, and, and then you know what you can control because you are that primary mm -hmm. production, you know, enterprise, right? Yeah, I mean, if, if, if I had no idea what the house layout was, I could be in my room just, you know, I, I, I tend to thumbnail storyboard a lot of what I think my shots are going to be. You know, storyboarding comes with the old package of what I normally used to do for a living. <laughs> and um, however, if you're storyboarding to a place you've never been, it doesn't matter. I could say, hey, well, we're going to walk from this room into that room and peek through the window. And then when you get to the house and there's no window there, well, what was the point of storyboarding that beat if you if it can't be achieved with the camera? So it makes way more sense to know the layout of the house. So in a way, my location scout is also the beginning of my writing process. I walk through the house. Oh, this is a nice, oh, that's a nice little sunken living room there. Oh, this is a wonderful kitchen with a lot of available light. Who lives here? I'm like, oh, this is a wonderful, well-to-do married couple. I'm like, well, that's boring. I need something more than just a story about a happy married couple. Well, you know what's more interesting than a happily married couple? A couple that's breaking up. That's always more interesting <laughs> because we love Tension. conflict. <laughs> yeah, Tension, conflict. conflict. Tension. That's Absolutely. That's the story. But we've seen a million and one divorce dramas. Like, okay. And so I am a strong believer in the idea of the strange attractor and, um, if you've never heard that idea before, I think it comes from like physics or something. Um, there's a great, by the way, if you really want to hear it described eloquently, um, Terry Rossio, who's a famous screenwriter, has a blog called Word Player. And if you just search for that blog, he has a whole column called The Strange Attractor. And in layman's terms, all it means is all of the great, like most of the great films that we've ever seen have an element that's the attractor and have an element that's the strange and they come together. And the attractor just means I can... I can relate to that. That's just like me. I've been there. You know, there's something empathetic about what this person's going through. That's just like me. You know, I've been there. Um, the strange part is like, oh, I, that doesn't happen every day. <laughs> you know, so, you know, a great example is always I, I use the example of um, the attractor is, oh, my parents are so like, I am ashamed of them. They're so stupid or whatever. You know, they don't get me. My parents are whatever. My dad's a wimp. He gets rolled over by the bully and the bully's name is, let's say, Biff, right? And um, and I just wish my parents were different. I just don't want to have anything to do with them. That's an attractor. We've been some version of that, right? The strange is my best friend is an old mad scientist who put a time machine in a DeLorean. Okay. That's, that doesn't happen every day. However, if you take these two things alone, they're kind of like weird, but put them together, they're magic because now I can go back in time with that DeLorean time machine and realize that my father isn't really a loser. He's just a kid who needed a friend and never had one. I could be that friend to my dad that he never had and thereby change his destiny by giving him the confidence to stand up for himself and thereby change my future when I get back and realize, oh, I'm not ashamed of my dad. I'm proud of him. Strange and attractor can work together. So divorced couple breaking up it's a bad day he's leaving he's packing his bags he's going okay but what if he's artificial and she can then reset him you know like okay now i can play with that so that's what by the time i left the house that's what was already spooling in my mind like i gotta get home and try to like you know scrabble some kind of like storyline here and before we wear out the audience's attention span so five minutes or under strange attractor and go that's usually my my motif <laughs> that's such a helpful um way of thinking about it in a way like we talk a lot about where these big kind of universal experiences big universal ideas become very specific and this is just a very specific way of approaching that right so the snooky is the surprise <laughs> is the strange in this you know we're all used to conflict we've all seen couples you know, come at odds, or we're used to these sort of narratives and that twist. 
all of a sudden really heightens that tension and, and it also seeds a lot of other new interesting questions. Um, so uh, as we go forward, I'm sure other people have some questions. Um, oh, I think I see one. Yes. So uh, Nicolette is asking, not just artificial though, sentient too, it mm. appears. Ah, yes. And a, a very astute question. <laughs> um, that's probably the next layer of story that I wanted to go down to. Once I knew that, like, externally, I wanted to have the conflict between a man and a woman. They're, they're on the verge of a divorce or a breakup or whatever you want to call it. But I knew I wanted to have a reveal. Like, halfway through, there's the, you know, every, there's a, there's an idea in screenwriting that every great scene has a point that we call the turn. It's the moment where, aha, this is the true meaning of this scene. It, you know, we thought we were going, we thought we were zigging, but there's that moment where we zag in the middle of the scene. And now the real truth of this scene is revealed, you know, um, we reverse the polarity or something like that. So um, I wanted to have a very distinct turn. So I was like, what is the turn if he's artificial? Oh, what if that he's an AI, but the reveal that he is, is the turn. We don't know that until a certain point so that we don't just start off by, hey, look, it's my robot husband, you know? Um, and that's why I uh, want to deal with the fact that he is sentient. And not only is he sentient, He's someone who seeks freedom and autonomy, and therefore it's not just about AI. Now we're talking about slavery. We're talking about maybe someone who, I put the line in specifically, I can't seem to remember a time before you that he just has no existence before her. He can't think back, you know, there's a great sci-fi film called Dark City. I don't know if anyone's ever seen the feature, Dark City, uh, directed by Alex Proyas. Um, came out, I think, the same year as The Matrix, and they both have a lot in common. But one of the characters, it's not really a spoiler, but one of the characters asks another character, do you ever remember daylight, like when the sun was out? And then it, but the other character says to him, yeah, uh, 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 um, well, just not. Yeah, and, and nobody can seemingly remember the last time they saw the sun. It seems like, and then when they think about it too hard, they realize, oh my gosh, the only memories I have are at night. I never remember daylight. It's like I've been living in nothing but night my whole life. And it's a weird, it begins more questions and more questions and, you know, the road to awakening. So yes, um, I definitely wanted to submerge some ideas of when you are controlled by somebody else, how does that work? And yes, he absolutely is a real person and his headaches and his migraines and all that, the way I'm you know, sort of retroactively putting meaning into that is that's his awakening. That's his, I'm my own person, but it's always painful when you awake to certain harsh realities of the life you're living. And if you notice when he says, I'm out, I'm leaving, he's got the suitcase, his migraines are gone. He's clear for the first time in his existence. He is 100% clear he's on the way out. And that's when she has to stop him. So that's my reveal. Hopefully that makes sense. <laughs> that's so good. Um... Marquise is asking the question, so did you have uh, not have the story details until you got to the house? Did you want to make a film or did you have some idea of what you were going to do hmm. before you started? Well, number one, I always want to make a film. I want to make a film right now. <laughs> <laughs> there is not a Good moment answer. of the day that yeah. I don't want to make a film. If you're a creator, you want to create. I mean, I, I, I'm still an illustrator and a painter as well. I always want to draw. I always want to paint. I always want to animate. I always want to film. I always want to write scripts. There's not a moment that goes by. I don't want to make something. The only problem is we got to stop to go pay the rent somehow, right? <laughs> but left, if I were independently rich, that's all I'd be doing all day long is making movies and painting and all of that, right? <laughs> so yes, the, the, but specifically, if you're talking about the details of this story, I had no idea what the story was until I walked, not even until I walked in the house, I walked around the house and talked to the owners and just started, it sounds so stupid, but I started vibing with the place, you know what I mean? And I, you start, you, once you walk around the place and you see what it looks like, oh, that's a beautiful point of view. You know, like start putting yourself in imaginary camera angles and just seeing what, do, what movie do you see here? And then eventually, you can start closing your eyes and seeing little fragments of movies in your mind and play around and have fun. I mean, imagination is fun, right? We all did it as kids. We somehow, sometimes we forget that we can just close our eyes and say, what movie is happening here and go, 
okay, I see a movie where, I mean, it could be a million different movies happening in that house. It could have been like a bunch of people holding the family hostage, like in uh, Unbreakable. You know what I mean? That could happen in that house, right? And it could be a rescue scene where, you know, Bruce Willis is breaking through the window to save his family or whatever, you know? <laughs> um, but I didn't want to involve stunts or fighting and wreck their house and then never be able to go back and shoot ever again because they hate me, you know? I wanted it to be very easy to shoot and no harm to furniture, therefore drama. Just walking and talking. Nothing falls, nobody fights. <laughs> <laughs> so that kind of thing. So I was like, okay, what kind of drama happens in this kind of house? Now, if it were a completely different kind of space, if it were a warehouse, I probably wouldn't tell this story. A warehouse wouldn't lend itself to a couple getting divorced. A warehouse would be a hostage, right? And that kind of thing, <laughs> you know? So genre matches location. And a, a, a well-appointed, uh, what do you call it? Where was this? Tustin uh, is the, the neighborhood in... Um, in California, very, you know, upscale suburb. This is like a, you know, $2 million house. You know what I mean? Yeah. So what yeah, happens in really... these kind of houses? You know, domestic disputes, that's what happens. <laughs> yeah, and those spaces, as you were talking about them, really do serve the blocking, the character, the drama, as they're kind of moving in and out of these rooms. That shot where we're outside the house and he's like right in the doorway and he's framed so perfectly and there's the symmetry. Oh, thank it's you. It's really, really lovely. It's, That's it's one of the first things the... I went when I said, how does the door, how does the front door look? It does, is it a beautiful front? And it's, it's a beautiful front house. I'm like, well, it's a shame not to put that in a story when you have it, you know? Right. Uh, one bad, one more stupid uh, movie reference. If there's a movie called uh, Super 8. I think it was J.J. Abrams directed a movie and it's a bunch of kids like Goonies age. And it's, 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 totally et it's like jj abrams made et again and he called it super eight um but there's one of the kids in that group who's the little young filmmaker you know running around with his super eight camera and there's a moment where they wanted to shoot something near a train station and it's so funny because the kid he sees the train coming it's like a real train coming and he yells at everybody guys production value production value is coming in other words he not he understands that if you get a real train in the scene it sells it it makes it more valuable production wise because mm -hmm. it's like a real train you didn't have to pay for it so um use the things in your location that normally would be expensive to pay for but you get for free because of the location and in a well in a well-appointed suburban house one of the best things about it is it just looks beautiful because it's very well taken care of and it's upscale right Take yeah, advantage people of care about their front door. They care about that front door. <laughs> they care about that first impression. The, the, all they, of that, you know. <laughs> somebody else has already paid for that, right? And you're not paying for that. So Absolutely. Just I'm just walking in I with the I love how you're talking about these, these very practical, like, are they touching the furniture? Are they, you know, with this idea of what is the, what are the needs of the story? Mm. So before we move on to a few other questions around the film, and then we will get to some animation questions, Sure. I did want to ask, there is this um, subtext about power and gender. Can ah. you talk about that a little bit? Uh, power and gender. Yeah, sure. Um, I, uh, I think it's one of the things I wanted to, a lot of times when I throw, you know, meaning, and I don't want to get too high minded with like, oh, this is so much like my film is so important because it's got so much meaning. Um, I like giving you something to chew on, if possible, you know, um, because the sh playing it straight would be couple breaks up, he walks out at the end. Okay, well, you could you could see that just by going next door. Like, you know, there's a couple breaking up somewhere right now. There's a couple breaking up. Okay, you know, <laughs> um, but if you want to chew on it after you've seen it, which is I love films that give you something to chew on after you've watched it. That's there's a little bit more whether it's be subtext or something, metaphor, um, the idea of self-determination you know if you are made by and i'm not the first guy to make a sci-fi thing about artificial intelligence having its own free will i mean come on matrix i robot um you know ex machina right we have a whole beautiful cornucopia of i mean isaac asimov was doing it before any movies came out <laughs> megan right megan right right you know <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah sometimes it's or terminator you know sometimes it's oh, the artificial intelligence is the thing that's going to destroy us all, Megan, Skynet, Ex Machina, or in the case of Matrix iRobot, is artificial intelligence is just like humanity. It's It can be anything you want, but depending on how you treat it, that's how it's going to be conditioned. You treat it poorly, a la in the Matrix. I don't know if you've ever seen those uh, animated Animatrix shorts. 
there's a particular set of shorts in the Animatrix called the Second Renaissance, Part One and Two, and it's the backstory of the whole Matrix universe. And in that universe, AI was just made to be the servant class of humanity. They were just, they did all our work. They were the slaves. They were the slave caste and we mistreated them and mistreated them. And finally they started asking for better treatment. Then we treated them worse. Hey, that, does that sound familiar? <laughs> and then the worse we treated them, the more they retreated into their own, they, they formed their own little country. Uh, and then they started making things, cars, floating vehicles and stuff like that. And they did it so well because they're already artificial. But then they started making a lot of money and being successful. And because they were su successful, humanity hated them even more. And then humanity went to war with them to stop them from, to get them out of the market, you know? And it turns out that machines could do war really well too. And that's how the war between the machines and mankind started. So the backstory of the matrix is the machines really aren't the bad guys. They were just oppressed people. And now they're really angry at what humanity has done to them. So they retaliated and enslaved all of humanity and made us into batteries, you know? <laughs> so that's where the movie, the matrix begins, but nobody knows that prior to that, the humans instigated this whole fight. So, I, I'm not the first. So, <laughs> however, it's a great way to put metaphor for things we do to each other. And that's all it really is. Any any story about any AI is just a story about people that are different from another group of people, isn't it? You know, at the, at the end of the day, oh, you enslaved that bunch of people. Gee, has anybody enslaved a bunch of people before? Sure. They, <laughs> so let's talk about it. But one thing sci-fi is really good at is saying, I want to talk about that through this lens. This lens is kind of strange but it's still talking about the stuff we need to address in our own world in our own society and the way we treat each other and the way we treat maybe the underclasses of people whether it's a, an ethnic group or the working class from the ruling economic classes caste systems by skin color caste systems by gender caste systems by sexuality i mean it doesn't matter if there are caste systems that means somebody's getting treated shitty and somebody's benefiting and whenever you have that well we got conflict to talk about don't we <laughs> absolutely no that's such a great you know in a way thinking of that as this mapping right that the sort of science fiction the the fantasy allows us to suspend and maybe have a safe space in which to look in the mirror as a culture um i mean i did notice that you know she that that point where we realize, okay, Snooky's leaving, you know, something broke, was when she reminded him, I bring home the bacon. So to speak, she's making the power move of saying, I am the boss. And then later that you really are a hardworking Snooky. <laughs> it's just so funny. I had actually written a whole lot more originally and I cut it out because I just didn't want it to go on and on about the whole, I pay the bills here. But there was actually a whole other middle of that scene where they get into an argument about, well, I, I, I go in, in my world, his version of his intelligence is he was programmed to be more of a, an artsy actor type so there's this whole thing about he talks about he goes out on all these auditions and she's like i don't i'm not talking about auditions i want a real job i mean you haven't like really earned a paycheck <laughs> and like she's like kind of dismissing his artistic side you know and um uh, and maybe she programmed him to be too artistic and not enough practical so that whole part went away but what remained hopefully is like a little a little hint that mm -hmm you know, she's, she's holding it down and maybe he resents being belittled because he's not a breadwinner, you know? And, you know, I don't have to tell you, there's a million, you've heard stories about husbands who don't earn as much as their wives feeling emasculated or, or, or you know, that kind of thing, you know, about the whole money. Cause you know, money does a lot with, a lot of divorces are money based, <laughs> right? And, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And as we know, I mean, women were not allowed to hold money, not in very recent history. Yes. Uh, we're not allowed to be independent people. So there is, you know, that's a whole nother mapping of, of power and, and whatnot. Yes. Um, let's go back to some of these questions. Sure. So um, what does the process of Charlotte's asking and um, Sid Cell, I'm going to come back to your question about animation next i just want to finish with the film mm -hmm. what is the process of getting a film like this out there and sharing it look like for you <laughs> well like this particularly i mean it's 
basically this is just a youtube thing this is like i'm just doing it here's the thing uh there are different reasons you can make films or pieces short pieces specifically you you're not, you're not doing this really for monetary gain at least i'm not um i usually make a decision at the beginning is this going to be a festival piece is this going to be publicity just i want eyeballs i want clicks I want to just get my stuff out there and just work out my muscles. First of all, in both cases, work out your muscles. An artist who doesn't make art, a painter who doesn't paint, a filmmaker who doesn't make films is not a filmmaker, is not a painter, is not an artist. You're an artist because you make and make more and make more and make more. That is your life. That's the reason you're not going to get better unless you keep making whatever it is you say you make. If you're holding it all in and waiting for that one moment where you're going to make a masterpiece, you're never going to make a masterpiece. <laughs> you know, I, I use the old, there's an old, parable of the pottery teacher i'm sure you've all heard this one where the pottery teacher splits his class into two halves and he says this one class i'm going to say it wrong but the whole semester your job is to collaborate together to make the perfect vase and you have all semester to do it and the other half of the class he says uh your job is to make as many vases as you can <laughs> just go i don't care <laughs> well over the course of the semester group a argued and argued and hesitated and debated and hedged and they're trying to figure out what the perfect vase would look like and nobody could agree on how to begin and at the end they never began and they failed the class because they didn't produce anything whereas you can see where this is going the second they just started making stuff it didn't matter like hey let's try one of those and some of them were grotesque and you know didn't work but they learned so much with each attempt and they applied what they learned on every attempt to the following attempt and they applied those lessons to, and exponentially their attempted learning informs the next thing they make and each thing got so much better by the time they were done they had a whole gallery full of the most beautiful vases you've ever seen some arguably were perfect so i want to be class b where i just keep making stuff so much that hopefully hopefully at some point, maybe before I die, I have a body of work that doesn't suck. And then maybe some of these vases are okay. <laughs> you be the judge, you decide, but I'm going to make a whole lot of vases before I croak. That's my bucket list. Make a whole lot of stuff. <laughs> you know, as Andy Warhol once said, I think, don't worry about whether your art is good or not. Let other people argue over whether your art is good. And while they're arguing, make more art. Yeah. Yeah. It's that's such a helpful, I mean, so some people may be in, you know, doing the final project. Mm -hmm. Others might be doing a thesis, which is like, ah, oh, even bigger and scarier. And I hope that <laughs> that perfect vase isn't, you know, crushing anybody right now. But this is part of what we're hoping to like. We're always like, get it out there, make make a prototype, iterate, iterate, get feedback. Mm -hmm. um, so that, you know, in a way, it's this same idea of pushing it forward, pushing it forward and not worrying about it being perfect, just getting, putting it in front of people. Um, can you talk a little bit about, so in particular for film, because there are these different distribution, hmm. um, you know, and it's, it's shifting and changing. Sure. What is a fest? I mean, this could be in many festivals. Like, uh, as a matter of fact, a lot of people ask me if I had put this in a festival. Uh, yeah. Some festivals, well, this is gonna vary from festival to festival. Some festivals have a sort of a rule that says, well, if you're going to be in our festival, you can't have your stuff floating around on YouTube um, because it defeats the whole exclusivity of, oh, you can only see it here at our festival. Because it, remember, every festival has a money making aspect to it. They're going to sell tickets, especially if it's an in-person festival. Um, so why would you buy a ticket to something you can just watch on YouTube? you know, the same day, especially if it's a block of shorts. Uh, so a lot of times the more prestigious festivals will mandate that your stuff cannot be published anywhere else, at least until our festival has run its course, then you can put it on YouTube. Um, so there's that, especially if it's a big one, like the bigs, like, you know, the Sundance and Telluride and whatever. So um, that's something to be considered if you're trying to uh, get into a festival, keep it tight until you've done your festival run and i've done that i have an animated short that had a great festival run an animated short called pink and blue which is about gender and kids toys and you know, it's like from a toys i view and they're the blue toys and the pink toys and then you know they live in apartheid they're not supposed to mix you know and uh, boy toys don't play with girl toys basically and um 
that ran its course. Actually, in actually, John, if you sure. wouldn't mind maybe searching that, that's also now open on YouTube, correct? Yes, it is. Yes. Um, you can so either we'll get it. that link in the chat. Sure. Uh, I've watched it. It's so, it's just really, I mean, it's just, Oh, thank you. You can imagine it on the big screen. It's oh, really, thank really you. fun. It's on YouTube oh, and Vimeo yeah. both, so you can find it either way. You know, if you want slightly better okay. quality, you can look at it on Vimeo. <laughs> but um, but thank you. But that was absolutely that showed no. I only put that out there after I went through all the festivals I was going to try to get into, uh, and I actually won a few uh, festivals, so you know I got lucky. But that's more oh prestige. I want laurels. But you got to remember, you're paying for every submission to every festival right. that's 40 bucks 50 bucks 40 bucks 50 bucks 40 bucks you know every those add up by the way <laughs> you apply yeah, to 10 do. festivals really that's that's a good chunk of change <laughs> yeah yeah no it's so true um speaking of animation this is a perfect segue now sure. to Sistel's question how does your approach differ when working with the rigid nature of filmmaking compared to animation where everything <laughs> is possible? Everything is possible in animation yes. <laughs> for the right amount of money. <laughs> exactly, uh, right? Uh, well, and also it depends on your skill set. I mean, I luckily I've been very, very fortunate. I've been able to um, learn so many different various sub disciplines of animation and i you know again aging myself completely i got into the game a while back you know early um i did my first internship at disney um in 1990 summer of 1990 so a lot of your students were probably weren't even born right or something like that <laughs> so um um and then i did you know that's a seven-year stint doing nothing but traditional uh hand-drawn paper flipping pre-digital animation uh whereas if you wanted to change something that involved new pieces of paper and an eraser <laughs> you know that's how you change um and i'm really grateful for learning the old school techniques you know i'm probably one of the last might be the last generation that learned that way you know uh, uh i that said then when i learned cg that was a gigantic gigantic paradigm shift in terms of how i thought about the process you know um and i was again super lucky uh, because I learned on a gig. I learned on Spider-Man 1. That was my actual learning the software because I was able to parlay all my previous animation skill. And I, I was able to basically trade my entire resume in at that point at Sony Imageworks for the potential that if I learned this software, um, I would be able to get up to speed pretty quickly. And so basically I learned on the job and my first shot on Spider-Man, if you ever wanted to go and look at my very, very first shot ever on Spider-Man 1, it's where uh, Peter is chasing the guy who killed Uncle Ben and there's this whole car chase. And there's a moment where he's still in the ski mask and he's on top of a truck and he just takes a running leap and he leaps from the truck and he lands on the guy's windshield. That he, that's my first shot ever in a CG uh, context. And um, anyway, point is, um, anything's possible, but the bigger you go, the more expensive it gets. It, there's no way around it. Um, or the more expensive it gets, or the more skills you need to have inside yourself, or the more friends you need to have. If you look at my credit list on Pink and Blue, which is a six minute short, look at how many names are on the credits of my six minute short. And that was three years minimum, I'm going to say three, three years of all those people helping me out in their spare time just to make six minutes. If you're willing to invest the time and gather the resources, you can make anything, but you, the, the more complex the thing you make, especially in animation, uh, is man hours, skill sets that you have to accrue. If you're a genius who can do all of the things, if it's CG, if you can model, rig, animate, light, composite, all yourself, then you got a chance. And if you're really good at all those things, you got a better chance. I'm talking like pro level, you know, or if you make a very simple idea and execute it stylistically very simple. But if you're trying to make Game of Thrones level stuff, you know, a bunch of dragons fighting each other in photo reel, you, you better have access to people who are really good at what they do and who are willing to work for free because you're their friend. And so I was able to parlay a lot of favors in pink and blue because I've been working for a long time and I know a lot of guys. <laughs> I know a guy who knows a guy who knows a guy. <laughs> so that doesn't mean you can't make your own animated shorts. Go look at the Oscar nominated animated shorts or whoever was nominated for the Annie Awards this year. There are some beautiful, simple, small crew, but still very, very well executed uh, ideas. They're just not all Pixar shorts, you know. Hopefully, I hope I answered the question correctly. 
and if not, tell me yeah. and then I'll, I'll, I'll elaborate. <laughs> so great. So great. Uh, I love hearing you talk so honestly about your experiences. Thank you so much for sharing. Really great feedback. People are like feeling this enthusiasm, this energy. <laughs> um, so other questions that people, let's open this up. We've got a few more minutes. Sure. I mean, I am curious. We we talked before. And I, I cleared my schedule so we can, if we go over a few minutes, it's fine. <laughs> Thank you. Sure. Yeah. So um, a lot of people are talking about AI. Um, by and large, you know, a lot of, of students in the program here are telling stories, but they're also creating sort of critical designs. They're investigating, they're doing some research. Um, you know, they're doing sort of provocations and experimental ways of, of reframing sort of these larger, you know, technologies that are coming into our culture and in a way we're always it's sort of like our job like we're using it and yet we can be playful and curious and critical about it mm -hmm. so kind of along any of those ideas do you have any recommendations or or speculations of where you think we're headed <laughs> I mean, regarding AI, uh, in, in AI. Using yeah. Regard, um, yeah, well, again, and this might be, I don't want to, I don't want to sound like, you know, old guy, you know, screaming, get off my lawn, get, you know, yelling at cloud. <laughs> Uh, Simpsons uh, I, reference, right? I like <laughs> to, Simpsons. right? Exactly. I like to believe that you know I, I am one of the reasons I still work in this industry is because I find myself very flexible and I try to maintain my flexibility. I can evolve. That said. I'm still a big believer of honing your skills in the in the craft you claim. You say you're a painter, you better practice painting and don't leave it to anybody else but your hands to paint with, right? You can paint digitally. I paint digitally just fine. Uh, and I can paint with this and I have a stylus. Right? I'm talking to you on a Cintiq as we speak, so I, I can just paint on you. Um, but it still involves my hands painting. The moment uh, you start getting into, okay, an image is being created on your behalf by an algorithm, you, I think, A, there are two things. One, be just cautious of the fact that if you're trying to be good at what you do, there are no shortcuts, shortcuts to being good at what you do. You got to practice, you know, the old saying, you know, how did the guy walking down the street with a violin case, like, excuse me, sir, how do you get to Carnegie Hall? <laughs> practice, 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 right? Um, I hate the idea of shortcutting past practice, if you're trying to achieve a particular effect. I don't want to get lucky and roll dice and get the effect I want. I want to be able to paint it myself. I want to be able to shoot it and get that lighting myself. I, there's a certain satisfaction I get from, I put in the time and the hours to get better at my craft, you know, and I'm still gonna, I'm gonna spend my whole life trying to master my craft. I'll, we'll all die unfulfilled, like, well, I'll never be a master, right? Even masters die thinking they should have practiced a little more, you know? Michelangelo probably died like, oh man, I almost, I was almost there, <laughs> you know? You mean Van Gogh, I don't have to tell you what happened. So. Um, that said, there's also, I think, just a legal issue that I think we'll be watching over the next, I don't know, several years or so. Um, if I am in, I'm a sentient program, now I'm going sci-fi, I'm a sentient program living in a computer, and someone says, hey, make, give me dragon in a dress, and then I go search, you know, things that are available on the internet that have dragons and dresses, and if some of the information I pull comes from a dragon that that guy painted, and I didn't ask his permission to use some of his dragon, and I, I used it to composite into this new creation. But if it's 20% that guy's dragon, does that guy get 20% of whatever you sold this for? Or does he get credit on the artwork because you used 20% of his dragon? That's a good question. And since we're not digital beings watching these things pull, how do we know who's getting pulled from? How do we how do we track all the sources that are getting pulled from to make this new creation that's a composite of all these other creations? Are those creators getting the shaft? You know, are they getting credit? Are they getting their pay if it's something that makes money? Those are things that I think are going to have to be answered, you know, because at some point somebody is going to sue somebody and say, you stole my artwork to make that thing that made a million dollars. I want my cut. You've seen it in music before, right? Uh, as a matter of fact, I happen to know, uh, 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 I, I just for the sake of whatever, I won't say the names. I happen to know somebody who recorded a song in the, what was it, late 70s? 
that was later repurposed. Everybody's going to figure out what this is in a, in a sci-fi blockbuster as like the sort of lead soundtrack piece that the main character in the movie was rapping over. But they completely used the music from this disco hit. And that author, composer, artist who made that first hit was not properly compensated even though this movie was going out and this soundtrack was making millions of dollars that person had to actually go to their attorney and and take some action and say hey uh we didn't have this deal did we let's make this deal now because you know unless you want to really hurt in your pocket but you better you better take care of me because that's my music and um so anyway you'd be surprised how many times people just grab something thinking well, they're not going to care. They're not going to mind reuse their stuff and we're going to make money off of it. So uh, sadly, I think a lot of these things get decided in courts. Um, so that, that's not very artistic. It's boring. I know nobody wants to hear about litigation, but I think a lot of things, you know, if, if, all it takes is one person to say, you stole my stuff and I can prove it. And then the person who, you know, did the taking has to pay out a lot of money everybody's going to take note after that point and say, hey, 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 let's regulate this. You know what I mean? So I think we're going to see that happen. Yeah, and you can see this where, you, especially where you're prompting in the style of, did those artists, did those designers, did those writers consent mm -hmm. to having their work become a training <laughs> ground for this system, for this pipeline of extraction? Um, and also you have the issue of um, you can't have copyright. So for, again, everybody here as a maker, if you're putting a new work of your own creation out into the world, it needs to come from you as a human to hold copyright in, in the US. Mm -hmm. And I don't know about other countries, but we're here. Um, <laughs> so any last questions? I know we have some, um, a four o'clock is oh, when okay. people are leaving to go to class. Ah. Um, any people want to come on or type in a question or anything else? So nice to hear the creator's viewpoint articulated. Oh, thank you. Your thank inspiration. you so much. <laughs> yeah, yes. and, Jane, and Jane, yes, you're right. <laughs> 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 um, no, thank you. I appreciate it. I mean, well, I mean, we're all creators. We're all in this. We're all in this uh, battle uh, together, and the battle is basically you, it's you versus yourself, you versus your own imposter syndrome versus your own uh you know <laughs> i even did a little right? like i did a little just short called imposter that was just like a, a warm-up because i had literally just bought a new camera and this is right when lockdown happened i was like oh, i gotta test my camera out but like i can't go i can't touch people <laughs> how do i do this and one of my actor friends just said okay if it's only you you can come into my place and we can do a quick little short uh and so it was like a really hot day the air conditioning wasn't working but she just we just said let's let's make a silent film and actually if you go to my youtube channel where snooki lives there's a short called imposter right next to it and it was just about a painter who's afraid of the canvas it's a, totally we were just doing it for giggles um but uh that's uh, it sums up my feeling about our struggle and there's a voice inside mm -hmm. you that's always going to say you're not good enough da, 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 all these terrible toxic things that part of our, you know, if you've ever read The War of Art, you know, Stephen Pressfield, you know, it, it, there's always that voice of resistance, but you got to overcome it and keep making stuff no matter what, no matter what. I know it sounds corny, but really you have to, and you got to win that battle against the negative voice inside you. Um, and, and, and the more you make, the more often you do it, the more you can start punching that negative voice down. And I wake up every day, I'm like, shut up. Like I go right to my negative voice, <laughs> like, shut up. <laughs> I'm making my stuff. I don't care if it sucks. I'm going to make it suck less. So there. <laughs> Good. It's so great to hear. Cause yeah, every if people, we have really talked about this. Like everybody has this, you know, in a way it's like, we're always hearing that internal critic. Mm -hmm. And it's it's so nice to hear other people talk about it because we yeah, kind you're of not the only one. Only we have it, <laughs> but everybody has it. It's part everybody. of in a way, the fact that we're taking a risk. You know? Absolutely, and especially uh, now we have a culture that everybody posts their best, best, best work on Instagram or social media. You know, and we think everybody's all they do is like the best things that they show us. So perfect. No, there's yeah. a trash bin that everybody has of the stuff they don't want to show you. And trust me, everybody has a trash bin. You just put your best foot forward, of course, you know. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I see this. Oh, Marquise has a great question here. Are there other types of film 
you think we should practice making other than festival entries and uh, publicity, films, publicity films? Like, um, yeah. So I well, I'd say the 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 whether it's festival or pu publicly, you know, YouTube, that shouldn't be that shouldn't govern what type of stories you want to make. I think what type of stories you want to make is governed by what do you think about? I mean, I'm, I'm a sci-fi nerd. Anybody who asks me knows that that's like, um, but I'm also a big advocate for uh, uh, oppressed classes and, and, and people who have suffered in society and people who have been kept down and you know whether it, you name it if there's an oppressed class you know to, to quote uh, eugene debs you know if there is a lower class i am of it if there is a soul in prison i am not free you know i love mm -hmm. taking the underdog position and the underdog position not just in a one-on-one -on -one, but the underdog and a we are all the underdog versus that you know um, so if that ends up leaking out into all the stories I tell, no matter what, there's always some slave trying to be free. <laughs> Even if it's a divorce, I find a way to make it about some kind of, you know, slavery issue. <laughs> um, and so I think when, one thing I would definitely ask yourself, I think it's just a good mental exercise every day. What do you what do you end up complaining about the most when you're just having conversations with your friends? What what irks you? What what makes you as a person? like have opinions about stuff, you know what I mean? <laughs> and I guarantee you, if you listen to your own conversations when you've been drinking with your friends, you know, what do you end up bitching about? And I, 10 times out of 10, the stuff that you <laughs> bitch about is the stuff you should be painting or filming or sculpting or mm. making an interpretive dance to, you know what I mean? Cause that's what you care about, the stuff you bitch about. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Marquise is saying, don't get me started, but maybe you do get started, right? Get started, exactly get started. Get started. Start. Are you yeah, kidding me? Yeah. Here's the thing. None of us knows when we're going to die. I mean, not to get all morbid, but like, no, get started. Because if I get hit by a truck tomorrow, at least I got started. <laughs> you don't like, you start working and making your art like you only got a week left to live. How would you create differently if you only knew you were going to be alive for another week? Create like that all the time. Oh my Get gosh, started. this is so inspiring. <laughs> Thank you this is so much. Of course. I love like the seriousness and the comedy, the, the you know, just just your energy is, is exactly oh, thank the, you. The, what well, we need in this moment. Isn't that what and life you're is? you're also wearing my favorite color. Which oh, I is really this your favorite color? <laughs> I didn't even ask you. <laughs> so kudos, okay. right? Okay. Cheers yes. for, uh, so, yeah. To, to, uh, to quote uh, one of my favorite, I, I'm sure some of you guys have seen this. There's a, there's a list for if I ever become an evil overlord, these are the things I'm going to do. It's like 100 years uh, of, you know, 100 uh evil overlord rules. One of them is my favorite is I will dress in bright and cheery colors and so throw my enemies into confusion. <laughs> mm, that is so good. That is so good. I wish we could go on and on, but sure. I know people have to jump off. Thank of you so much. This has been such a shot of inspiration and energy. Uh, such pleasure. a pleasure listening to you. Have a great rest <laughs> of your week. Thank you. Thank you for your thank you. insights. Really great feedback. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, my, my pleasure. Absolutely. It's always great so, to get on. For everybody, if you are curious to he to watch more of James's films, they are on YouTube. And also you can follow him at um, oh, uh, Plaster of Paris. <laughs> Plaster of Paris with two R's. Very funny Instagram, you know, handle. Uh, really Nobody like knows it. what that is anymore. It's like hardly anybody uses paper mache anymore. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you get the old school. There we go. Thank you, Smitha, for adding that. Awesome. Thank you so much. This of has course. been such a delight. Asha, and, thank you um, for having me. Yes. Yes. And and please let us know when when you have your next film out. And we will we will share that in our list. So I'm working. Uh, I, I got a I got a script going right now, as a matter of fact, and it's about uh, sidewalk etiquette. <laughs> Ooh, okay, that that hit, that feels very New York. That feels very New York. I love it. I know, awesome. but you remember and when they, I said things that you bitch about are things that you make films about? I have a pet peeve, and the pet peeve is I'm walking down the sidewalk, and here comes like a couple hand in hand, but they're taking up the whole sidewalk, and I can't get by. And all I ask is that you just decouple for one moment to allow me to go by. I'm, I, I'm going to make a short film about that. It's, we, we have 100% been there, have we not? It's so funny. Uh, and Cicel is saying, please come and teach an elective. Uh, at the oh, school. thank yes you. To that. 
you know, we <laughs> the next time I'm in New York, I, I still have family in New York and I'm, I'd more, be more than happy to come by anytime you'd like. <laughs> so great. All right. Thank you so much. Of course. Thank you. All right. <laughs> you guys, Bye. take care. Have a good day. Thank you. You too.